Hello, good morning. Welcome to the second episode of Tracy Schatz Voices for Change radio show on the Incandescent Radio Network. I am Hope Katz Gibbs, creator of the communications company Incandescent Inc. And today we are thrilled to introduce you to Kelsey McKay, a highly recognized expert on criminal asphyxiation in the context of sexual and interpersonal violence, child abuse, and human trafficking. She's also the president and CEO of Respond Against Violence, an organization that integrates the experience of individuals, communities, and systems to improve the collective response to violence and trauma. This topic is tough, we know it, but it's also incredibly important for all women and men to know about this. So I'm gonna throw the conversation over to the wonderful Tracy Schott. Um, She met Kelsey in 2009 at the Conference on Crimes Against Women in Dallas, and we look forward to hearing what you all have to teach us today. So take it away, Tracy. Thank you, Hope. Um, We are just so excited to have Kelsey here be our first guest on Voices for Change Radio. So as Hope mentioned, I met Kelsey at the Conference on Crimes Against Women almost two years ago. And I actually went to um, an early morning uh, seminar that she was co-presenting on intimate partner violence and pregnancy. Well, you know, that's the topic of Finding Jen's Voice, my film. So obviously I went to see what, what they were talking about. Lo and behold, they mentioned my film and actually showed the trailer, which I was very grateful for because we were presenting um, the film that evening. And Afterwards, I went up to thank Kelsey and introduce myself. And she responded by giving me a big hug. And, um, and I knew then that we were gonna be friends. Um, and that was really the start of our sister romance. Um, and uh, we just found so many places that we connected. Um, so Kelsey, thank you so much for being here. Oh, you're so welcome. I'm so excited to be here, Tracy. And thank you, Hope, for having me. So Kelsey um, and I, when we were trying to figure out how to squeeze uh, our conversation into a half hour, because uh, we tend to talk a lot when we get together, we we both came um, at this whole domestic violence um, arena sideways. You know, I I was, uh, I'd been a social worker, I'd done child and family therapy. I'm sure I interacted with intimate partner violence a lot. Um, and didn't even recognize it. Right. Um, and uh, for Kelsey, um, she was an assistant district attorney um, for the city or the Travis County right. where Austin, Texas is. So Kelsey, tell us a little bit about how you ended up in this whole field. Yeah, sure. You know, one of the things about working in the field of domestic violence and probably sexual assault as well is that so many practitioners that work in that field, uh, mostly advocates, have this history with it. So they were driven towards doing something within a system um, that would make other people's experience better than either their own or their sisters or their daughters. Um, That's, you know, it's very different than like prosecuting drugs or DWIs where, you know, people aren't necessarily already ingrained in that world when they walk into it to do something about it as an adult. You know, as a child, I grew up in developing countries and lived in Jakarta, Indonesia from fifth grade until I graduated high school. And so I was always pretty familiar with, you know, uh, pain, suffering, uh, poverty, these types of Things often surrounded me even as a child, human trafficking, child abuse. And so my motivation to become a prosecutor, well, was first and foremost, as my father told me, I couldn't volunteer the rest of my life. And so I had to get a real job and I'd gone to college and I went to law school and I found prosecution originally to do something like child abuse and human trafficking. And when I was a misdemeanor prosecutor, which Um, You know, the bulk of what you're doing are things like possession of marijuana and DWIs and minor thefts and, you know, kind of crimes that are not all that exciting. And um, the one exception to that is domestic violence, is domestic violence in many cases, um, many of the cases are misdemeanors. So when someone just causes bodily injury, that's a misdemeanor case. And I was excited mostly about the idea of doing violent crime because that's where my passion was, was being around that type of thing and doing something about it. 
And so I volunteered to go to our domestic violence court. It wasn't something that everyone else wanted to be in, but it got me close to violent crime and kind of like the real crime as I saw it. Obviously, DWIs can have horrible consequences as well as drugs and all of that. But, you know, that's what pulled me into domestic violence originally was to get that experience in violent crime so I could go and be a felony prosecutor and move on and probably never look at domestic violence again. And the moment I landed in that court was the moment I realized, wow, we have no idea what we're doing. And here I was, golly, like 24, 25 years old. And I had these people's lives in my hand, obviously looking back at it 15 some odd years later, I'm kind of shocked that anyone gave me that responsibility. Um, and that's how I kind of stumbled into it. And I, I, I enjoy a challenge. Um, and domestic violence is a challenge for, for people, for families, for communities, for systems, um, on so many levels, how we manage and deal with domestic violence in the criminal system um, needs so much work. And so I took that on specifically with strangulation cases, which for many, many years were treated as misdemeanors. And yet we know they are one of the most lethal types of violence that often leaves no external injury. And so, you know, that's kind of how I ended up in it. And then I never left it. I've kind of gone back and forth and done child abuse and sex crimes and a variety of things. But my foot, once I, once I saw that that water was there, I, I couldn't get away with that. And so, um, you know, that's how I landed into it. And it's funny because when you came up to talk to me at that crimes conference, I, I knew your film because it really was the turning point for me when I was a prosecutor and I did not understand domestic violence beyond, you know, someone hits someone, you know, and in the criminal community, it's all about the penal code. Like what are the elements of the crime, which is a complete deviation from how we should treat domestic violence. I, I say everything I learned, I learned from an advocate because they do this correctly. You know, they're holistic about their approach. They understand trauma. They understand the complexity and they get that it's not just about the hit in that moment. The hit in that moment may be what called the police, but domestic violence is so much bigger and more complex. And so I have learned so much over the years from advocates. And in Austin, we were lucky to have the opportunity years and years ago, um, I think when it first came out to see Finding Jen's Voice, which is of course the film that you directed. And it was for me the aha moment. It took me from a prosecutor and a human who did not understand domestic violence to someone who walked out of that I think it was at the Alamo Draft House or something. I walked out of that film um, movie theater, which is weird to even think about now that we could go to movie theaters. And it, it changed how I understood it because you did such a powerful job explaining non-physical violence. So that's maybe why I gave you a hug. I am a hugger. Um, but it really, for me, there are a few times where I've had aha moments in my career and that was without a doubt one of them. So I'm honored to be your first guest. And um hope that what we can help other people do is to come to domestic violence um, from the sides and someone shouldn't have to be abused in order to have a voice in this system and really to get all men and women on board to understand healthy relationships all the way to domestic violence. Yeah and I think that you know um, with finding Jen's voice I had a multitude of aha moments and um, people would share this research with me and I thought, you know, I'm a pretty well-educated, aware person, well-read. How come I don't know about this? Why, why did it take this poor young woman being murdered and me doing a flippant Google search to find statistics showing uh, homicide to be a leading cause of death during pregnancy. I mean, why, why is this not um, public uh, in the public awareness, right? And yeah. so that's why I did what I did. You know, it's why I made the film. Well, and what I found is, you know, I don't think DV has had their moment yet. You know, Me Too has really opened up the conversation to something that tends to be gender based. Um, I think anything that is gender based in the terms of, of women, it, it's just not a prior, priority in our community and our culture. And um, for me, as the Me Too movement was happening, I just kept thinking like, okay, I hope this is going to open up even wider to gender based issues, because we don't have that voice. And with domestic violence, 
I, I, there is no one listening and nobody I know who doesn't know someone who's been impacted by it. And I think it's simply a lack of understanding about it. It is so easy to judge the victim in domestic violence for doing certain things, especially since so often their decision-making power has been taken away. And so it's so much easier to blame the victim than recognize the abuse of someone who appears to be charming. And, um, you know, and this is where we really need to deconstruct what domestic violence is so that people can even recognize it, much less understand it. And so, you know, I hope that we'll get our moment. I think that um, you know, we were talking about No Visible Bruises by Rachel Louise Snyder earlier, and, you know, just reading the first few chapters of that really allowed me to see, oh, you know, this is a movement that is new. I remember having a boss, and I kept getting so frustrated that our office, the DA's office, like, why do other, why are other people not as pissed off as I am? Like, why are people not mad? Why are, and I remember her just saying, you know, 20, 30 years ago, no one cared about domestic or no one cared about DWIs and then there's this whole cultural shift with mad and these types of things and it really helped me recognize like okay we just have to keep moving forward and then when I was reading reading uh no visible bruises she talked about the two kind of monumental things that happened in the late 90s which were the OJ Simpson trial and then the original passage of VAWA by Joe Biden and for me I realized in that moment that was like that's when I was in high school and I think when I came into prosecution, I assumed all the work had been done. Uh, you know, I looked at domestic violence like a DWI and just assumed that the foundation had been laid. And, and while, I mean, the people who have been in the, this movement before me have done an incredible job and really stepped things forward. When I saw like the year I graduated high school in conjunction with the OJ trial, which I remember and VAWA, which I didn't really know the history of, I thought, oh, this is still a new movement. And the voices of these survivors are often so silenced and so judged And while they're trying to deal with their own trauma, navigate their own lives. And I know, Tracy, I know you know just from the survivors you've worked with on Finding Jen's Voice that this is a longitudinal issue. Like it, it doesn't end for them when the abuse stops. I've had victims, I mean, the way that abuse continues years later through the legal system or the trauma impacts their life, it's a lifelong consequence. And, and you know, it affects it affects their relationships with their family members. It affects their relationships with their children. They frequently have to co-parent with their abusers for the rest of their lives. Um, financially, most women are just devastated by domestic violence. And on top of that, it shouldn't be their job to fix a broken system, right? So what I find is the more people we can bring into this, I mean, survivors are paramount. We need survivors' voices. I only, I only know this stuff because I have survivors who have given me the gift of trusting me. But in addition to survivors, we need other voices and we need, you know, we need human voices. And um, so I think that, I don't know if it's gonna require, every time I look at the news, I think, oh, here's our movement. Like it can't get worse than this. You know, every time we have a mass shooting and we know that it's a domestic abuser, every time a cop is killed and we know it's a person who had strangled a woman, every time we have a, every time we have that, I think, is this our moment? And I, I, I don't know, because I feel like I've seen every horrible possible thing and I don't know when that moment is, but I hope that conversations like this can move that along. Right, it, it really does take um, this understanding of what domestic violence is and is not, right? So um, I think, you know, we touched on, you know, it, it, it's about power and control, um, but for so many people, they don't really understand what that means. So it's easier to go, well, he hit you, why aren't you out the door, right? One time, gone not really understanding the progression of behaviors that have gotten, um, that have occurred before any violence actually happens. And right. it's that, that um, progression of behaviors that really sets up the power and control um, relationship that leaves a victim so vulnerable. You wanna talk a little bit about how, how you um, have uh, seen how power control uh, acts in the criminal world, like like the challenges? I, you know, I'm slightly embarrassed to, to admit the number of times I have used the phrase power and control 
um, both in conversation um, and frankly in trial as a prosecutor, like trying to commit, like get the jury to understand it. The amount of times I've used that phrase and never understood what it meant, right? And it, it's become kind of this coin phrase, advocates understand it. And when the power and control wheel was designed, obviously it was designed by people who understood it. And it identifies the most common behaviors um, that abusers will use kind of by category to control their victims. And so I, I threw around the phase, phrase, but I never understood what it was. And I would say your video is one of those things that gave me that moment of, oh, now I understand what they're saying. And maybe now I can explain it better to a jury. And really it's, the, it's when an abuser does something, uses some tactic or technique to instill fear in that victim. And that fear then controls the victim's behavior. I think in child abuse, it's so easy to recognize, okay, a child can be convinced to do something like lie, recant, um, act out. And we kind of give them empathy and we give them space to not be the perfect victim, right? And yet we continue to prosecute child abuse um, somewhat successfully. But as soon as you turn 16, 17, 18, it's like suddenly they take away what is a really complex dynamic. So for me, the way I see power and control, especially after listening and watching Finding Jen's Voice and then applying it for many years, is one, there are a lot of different techniques that people can do to instill fear. And it's not just fear of physical violence. And while physical and sexual violence obviously drive that home, especially for women, um, it can be every technique and they're categorized quite broadly, right? Like isolation. And I was thinking this morning, I went on a walk before this and I was thinking about how isolated we all are during this pandemic. You know, how it's driving me. I feel awful. My children can't play with anyone. I don't really get to see any friends. Um, and I'm like, I'm isolating my children. And right, the intent is not to control them. Well, kind of, because I don't want them to get COVID. But it's not to instill fear. That's not why I'm doing it. And so I think it's so important for people to recognize that behaviors, it's not about the act, right? It's about the intent and the result. It's about, did they do it with the intent to control me? And did was the result that it did control me? And, you know, you think of all the different things that can instill fear, you know, the risk of not just physical violence, but I could lose my job. I could lose my children. And so we see abusers use these tactics like calling CPS or calling the police on them, calling their employer, all these things that are non-physical that instill that fear that then controlled the victim's behavior. And so I think it's really important that we better understand that these techniques change depending on the victim and their vulnerability. So even the parent control wheel isn't something that you can just go through and say because it's customized. These are customized abuse plans that abusers have in their playbooks. They're customized to the victim's vulnerabilities and weaknesses. Why do you think um, it is so hard for the average person to grasp these concepts? Why, I mean, I, we, we talk about power and control, you talked about power and control, but it, it was really, you said that you, they were just words to you until you finally, like you had your aha moment. What is it about um, this whole concept? Why is it that when, we, when somebody gets to be 16, 17, 18, that we assume that they have control over their lives? You know, I think there are there there are two main reasons, um, especially in the criminal system. The first is that it's complex; it's beyond the penal code, right? It's forcing us to consider things that aren't an element of the crime. When an officer goes to a crime scene, they're looking for probable cause. That's a very low standard, very low burden of proof. They have to prove that a crime was committed, um, and that's their standard. And so, most cases tend to get investigated to that standard. And when a victim is not safe to participate in follow-up investigation and rarely able to safely participate in the prosecution, um, we have a hard time understanding all the details beyond he hit her on that day and it caused pain, right? So we're looking at the date. So I think the lack of complexity or the complexity that exists in these cases that isn't present in a lot of other crimes like DWI, like theft, um, makes it difficult for us to dedicate the time and resources and training that we need 
I mean, I don't remember any guidance or training. I was thrown in front of a jury as the prosecutor doing domestic violence with practically no knowledge of what I was doing. You know, I've had to try cases after reading the PC affidavit while the jury's walking in. And so in my experience in the criminal system, domestic violence is the redheaded stepchild. So it, it and it, it needs more resources just to help us understand. Um, so that really goes to the two things. One is we look at things in terms of an incident, not the context. And then the other reason I think that we don't treat these cases as they should be is the judgment attached to it. It is, there was an article um, that Julie Owens wrote that quoted, uh, uh, what's her, uh, Judith Herman's book, Trauma and Recovery. And she talks about how it's so much easier to believe the abuser and like act like this doesn't exist because believing victims means taking on their pain, taking on their trauma and navigating a very difficult case. You know, these cases need about 50 times the resource of other types of cases. I made that figure out. That's totally anecdotal. <laughs> no data supports that. Well, you know, the, um, the, the, the thing about um, kind of that judgment, like I keep coming back to that whole, you know, you see the judgment from judges, you see the judgment from prosecutors, you see it from police officers, they're judging the victim for not having control over their lives. Um, and it's, 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 it's really ingrained in our culture. There's this expectation that we have agency, right? That we have the ability to control what happens in our daily lives. And when that goes away, when we're standing on the outside of that, we don't understand it. And I think part of it comes from just our own fear of losing agency, of losing control. So we blame not the person taking the control, we blame the person who's allowed their control, their agency to be taken. Um, and it's a, it's a very interesting response, um, but it's a sociological response. It's happening throughout our culture and I think it's 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 more so in the Western culture that you know where we're you know we're cowboys like we you know we 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 take care of ourselves we well, pull right. ourselves up our bootstraps you know like all of this stuff that's part and parcel of our culture right exactly. so I think that there's absolutely and you know I think that go ahead I was going to say during this time of COVID especially. I mean, there's so many analogies we can make to like, welcome to not having control over your life, right? This is um, a unique time where it's like, we don't have control about if we're gonna get infected. I mean, to some extent, but no control over when we get the vaccine, no control about schools being open, no control about travel, you know, and how disorienting just that is. Well, imagine living every second of every minute of every day of every week, month, and year, trying to navigate and balance those things. And I think that, you know, you mentioned who judges them, you know, judges, prosecutors, cops, obviously the defense attorney, their job is to attack them. Like that is their job is to do that, is to represent their clients. And so victims don't have representation in the criminal system um, like defendants do. And man, so with no one on their side, they just get beaten down and say, you know, never mind. And beyond judges, I mean, their own parents are likely judging them. Their friends are judging them. Their children might be judging them. So it's not even just the system. It's their own personal support system. They have, you know, priests and um, people in their own support community, if that's a faith community, who are telling them, you know, work it out and this type of thing. And then I think the other thing that's really important to recognize is the difference between men and women and how so much of the issue is that I think 50% of our community doesn't even know what it's like to be a girl. And those tend to be the majority of people responding to these scenes. And the first contact with the victim is a male with a gun in authority position. And um, I think that is just where everything starts to go wrong. Right. So, you know, we, I know we could talk about this for forever, um, but I do want to talk a little bit about um, the strangulation supplement and your work and how, how you got into 
dealing in such a dark place. Um, right. and, how, and how do you get how do you, how do you heal from that as well? That's the second subject. Yeah, you know, I think that if you were to categorize crimes that are the most difficult and complex to to hold to do as a, I was a prosecutor at the time, I haven't been a prosecutor for four years, um, but as a prosecutor, it was domestic violence um, with a side of sexual assault. Those are two of the most difficult kinds of cases to prosecute. So much judgment is ingrained in them, and it's so difficult to get victims to trust the system. And frankly, they probably shouldn't. Um, and so being able to get their trust, um, I, I think that for me, um, within the cases of domestic violence, once I kind of felt like I had a handle on, okay, I can pick a jury, I can get a jury to under, I'm getting this, I'm going to lots of conferences and training. I went to some trainings and learned a little bit about this type of violence called strangulation. Um, and what I learned was how we were missing it. There had been some research published, kind of landmark research out of San Diego. And what I learned is, so these are really, really bad cases because as you know, once you've been strangled one time by an abuser, you are seven to eight times more likely to be murdered by that partner. So what, when I understood that there are these non-physical tactics, what I learned is some tactics are more dangerous than others. Um, some, some acts um, are connected to an increased likelihood of being murdered. So one of the things obviously you go over incredibly in Finding Jen's Voice is the role that pregnancy plays. And everything relates to an abuser losing a sense of control. And so when a, when a, when a victim is pregnant, right, that attention is shifted to that baby. And so he feels a loss of control. And that's why we have this increase in risk and lethality. Strangulation is the same thing. Is strangulation is something we know that abusers don't often use unless they have to, and it's kind of a last resort, which is why I think we see so much strangulation when a victim is threatening to leave or mentioning leaving or has lost that relationship is abusers have to think through, okay, I have to escalate my tactics. I have to instill more fear to retain that control. And so when I went to some conferences, I started, I was a misdemeanor prosecutor at the time, and it was before there was really any legislation surrounding strangulation. And so I was getting a lot of these cases that were filed as misdemeanors. Um, and to put that in context for our viewers, a misdemeanor is a class A misdemeanor in Texas and in most places is it's the same as like a theft of something over a certain amount of money. It is less than a theft of a higher amount of money. So we are not talking about a really high punishment range. We're talking about probation or up to a year in, in county jail. Um, and so as I would get these cases as a misdemeanor prosecutor, I mean, those were like murder cases. And I started to take them very, very seriously. And I noticed that other prosecutors were not. Um, and so I just kind of embraced it and learned everything I could over the last, I guess, almost 18 years now, went to every possible training, read every possible thing, learned about it. And I just see the whole world through this lens. Um, and what I learned pretty quickly, so around 2010, um, and it, it's on par with many other states, there's been a push to have strangulation legislation that makes it a felony in the criminal system across, across the country. Almost every state now has a law. And in Texas, that law was passed in 2009 and went into effect in 2010. And at, by that point, I became a felony prosecutor. We had a grant position for someone to handle all the strangulation cases. And of course, you know, here I went into an interview, like, here's why it'd be so great. And I mean, no one else wanted the job. But for me, I was so pumped and excited. And I tried my first strangulation case, and she had bruising all over her neck, um, which is very rare in these cases. And the jury came back with a not guilty. And I remember just kind of thinking to myself, wow, okay, so this is my entire caseload. And this is the best case I had. And I just lost and I put my tail between my legs and I went back and talked to the jury and, you know, they gave me good advice. I listened. I um, was humble. And what they said was visible injury wasn't an element. You didn't prove the elements. And what I realized at that point is although legislation has passed now in almost every state, training has not accompanied that. There's been no plan for implementation. So now we have all these laws, but they're very confusing elements. We have to prove things like impeding the blood flow. I, no one knows how to investigate that. 
and so I, I really just took it on one out of mere survival. I didn't want to lose every case for like the rest of my career. And I really started um, the following month. I tried a case and had a survivor who I adore and I'm still in touch with 12 years later, who had no visible injury, but she was willing to talk to me. And I just started asking her about what her body felt and how her head felt. And by the end of her testimony, what was zero evidence in the offense report went to 42 signs and symptoms of strangulation. Um, and we won that case and he went to prison and it really sent the benchmark for how can we do a better job with this? Because I walked away from that trial saying, I need that type of evidence in every single case. And where do we get that evidence? Well, with domestic violence, when we really know we have that moment in time when the patrol officer goes out to the scene and that's kind of it. Um, I really worked hard with our academies and cadet academies to train our first responders. And then about four years later, that turned into a form I created um, based on other forms like that, but really went through my experience in trying these cases, preparing against defenses, and that's the strangulation supplement. So that that's a form that's available for free. You can go to the Respond Against Violence website. Um, you can request and it guides a first responder through the questions they need to ask at the scene of an asphyxiation crime. So not just strangulation, but aquatic, suffocation. Um, and then we have a roll call series coming out, a show up training for police officers will be out in about five weeks um, that will help patrol officers understand how to use that document. And it has been revolutionary um, in our community and other communities, um, the quality of their investigations, the increase in officers' ability to identify it. It's kind of one of the things that I know we can solve in life. There's a lot of issues I can't solve. I can't fix COVID. I can't fix politics. There's a lot of things I can't solve, but this is an issue we can fix. We are failing and we can fix it. And it's, it's actually not all that difficult if we invest the right resources. Thank you so much for putting that together. Um, because the work that you've done in strangulation really has um, shifted a, the focus to putting perpetrators in jail um, who maybe got a slap in the hand before. Um, so I, I think that that training is really important. And I have sat through some of that training myself. And it's just, um, it's overwhelming um, and uh, if, if any of you practitioners, law enforcement out there have the opportunity to um, partake in that training, I highly recommend it. It's, it's great and you, and you get Kelsey's energy the whole way through it. So And I think also, Tracy, important to recognize that doing a better job investigating and identifying these cases is not just, yay, we put abusers in, in jail or in prison. Um, it validates the victim. I can't tell you how many times I'm doing a training and you know I've had everything from three people in a room to 2000 people in a room. There's not a training I've done yet where I don't see the person in my audience who has never had their experience validated. And in that moment I'm watching, they're hearing me describe the sensations their body feels, that they thought they were gonna die. So both their trauma, all of that gets validated. And to me that says, I mean, if you're in my audience, usually you work in the system. And so that they could have gotten this far and no one validated how bad that was because most people think they're gonna die. And also for survivors of strangulation, because when you're strangled and you think you're gonna die, you fight for your life. You do anything to breathe. That often results in scratch marks or bite marks on an abuser. And unfortunately, the trend I've seen is victims getting arrested. So this is not like a victim defendant kind of thing. Understanding strangulation is something I'm passionate about. And I would say half the cases I deal with are victims who have been wrongfully arrested, either for homicide, if they shoot their abuser when they're being strangled or after they've been strangled or they fight back during the course of a strangulation. Um, so it really is something that's ingrained, not just for prosecutors to understand, but for our entire system, including defense attorneys to really recognize so they can do a good job representing these clients because they do get arrested. It's um, really incredible how, um how little understanding, again, across the board, our, our culture has about um, intimate partner violence and the need for um, people to understand that it's not a women's issue. Um, and maybe we can talk a little bit about maybe what, what can we do? How do we get men involved? How do, how do we, how do we um, energize uh, 
at least 50% of our culture to uh, stop blaming victims and and uh, raise pe raise the bar in terms of behavior and expectations. You know, it's not just the how do we get them involved, it's the why should they be involved. You know, I, you know, I'm married, I have a father, I have two brothers, um, the majority of most of my audience are male law enforcement. And um, so I'm very familiar with having to convince an audience who is not naturally a female. And, you know, it goes back to kind of one of the things I talked about earlier, which is understanding the difference between boys and girls. So I have a daughter and I have a son. Um, and I've never been a boy. I've never been a man. I only have been Kelsey and I've only been a female. And I, for many years, just did not understand, you know, in the world of equality, which I'm all for, um, you know, I think we are taught if we are, you know, if we are raised by women who are enlightened um, and we read any kind of magazine, it's ingrained in us that we're equal and we are equal, but we are different. Um, and one of the things that we know that is the difference between men and women or boys and girls is fear. Um, the fear of what can happen to us and, and that it's a very real sense of fear. And this is not to say that boys can't be scared and men can't be scared. That's not at all what I'm saying, but on kind of this bigger macro level of gender, um, men don't understand what, what women are fearful of, why they're fearful. And so they tend to minimize it. So the best example, and this is an example I give in training is I have a great husband. He's very kind and very sweet. And I would travel all the time and I would pull into my driveway at like midnight after a day of training, then I'd fly home. And every time I pulled into my driveway, I would just get like my heart would, my heart race or my heart would race and I'd start to swell. I'd just be nervous because, and like, I probably don't even have to tell you what was I nervous about? You know, I was nervous that I was going to open my car door and someone was going to kill me or rape me before I got into my garage. So for, for about three years, I would text my husband and say, can you come up in the garage door and stand there while I come in? It was always well past his bedtime. And at first it would be kind of like, oh, Kelsey, you're fine. And I look at that and now I look back, he didn't do it intentionally, but it was minimizing because I already felt like a fool that I was asking him to do that because I should be stronger than that. Um, so then when his response was, you're fine, I felt like I couldn't ask again. Um, and it wasn't until years later, he actually went to this incredible benefit for an incredible organization I encourage people to look at, Project Beloved. Um, my friend Tracy Matheson runs it. I, without a doubt, go check it out. They do incredible things. I think we're going to talk about them more in our webinar. But he, we were sitting at the benefit. And the woman who was sitting next to my husband at our table was the one who got up and was the speaker. And in that moment, I saw it dawn on him, the difference between men and women, um, that he never thought about pulling into the driveway and getting raped and murdered, whereas that's an everyday occurrence <laughs> for me. And once he understood that, you know, I no longer had to say, can you come out? He did it automatically, or he'd be out there before I even texted him. And so when I look at all of these male police officers, the first thing I want them to understand is that when you go to a crime scene, like you're a man, and this is a woman, and this is a woman who has gone through this violence in acutely by someone who is an authority position to her, and now you got a gun, right? And you're kind of, you're uh, all these things. And so Really, I think if we understand and men understand how women live life and how fear is ingrained in us um, on a minute to minute basis, that's the good first step. And I, I think just educating men on that so they feel protected because I think men, you know, I hear my father, I feel, hear my family members and friends, they make all those judgments, you know, um, and they, oh, well, she did this and how do we know she's not lying? Like just all those things are the natural reaction. So I think the first step is, recognizing the different, the different ways men and women live their lives and then going from there. Because then we stop the invalidation that happens by both men and women, but certainly I think by men because they just, they've never lived their life planning to be raped and murdered like many women do. Well, and that's part of how we're raised. So right. as, as girls, you know, the whole, well, if you don't want to get raped, then you better not get drunk. And you maybe don't want to wear that short of a skirt. And they, the onus of staying safe is placed on women. It's not placed on men to not uh, rape and abuse women. You know, I mean, it's, it's, 
It's our, our culture needs to kind of absolutely that turn. Well, and I think that we need to be having more conversations with our children. So I am now, I have an eight and a 10 year old. I have a very curious 10 year old daughter who is like me, but more, which is a lot. <laughs> and we are having conversations about sex and conversation and like, not because I wanted to, but because I remember, I, I'm going to admit to a criminal act. I think the statute of limitations has passed now, but I remember being in fifth grade and stealing a book from the library. And the name of that book was now you've got your period. And I remember it was like this soft mint green with pink writing. And it's because I was curious about what was happening. Um, and I, you know, I always think, okay, I don't ever one want my daughter to commit theft. And two, I don't ever want her to feel like she can't ask me. And one of the, I guess, silver linings of COVID is I have been, I, I travel like at least 50% of the time I was away from home over the last four years since I left the DA's office. And um, I have been with my children for, I think we're at almost 11 months now. And what, and that's been good and bad. But one of the great things is we're having lots of conversations. Like we've almost run out of things to talk about. And I have, I, you know, people can send me the mail and the complaints, but one of the things we've started to watch is Gilmore Girls, um, which, you know, I quit, I forgot about how advanced it was. I thought this will be a great mother daughter bonding thing. And we've watched every episode of Andy Griffith. Well, like we've, we've run through everything. And I thought, I love Gilmore Girls, let's watch it. And it really has led to some very open, I mean, she was already curious about body stuff and wants to know how it works. And um, we're at the part where um, the daughter's about to have sex for the first time. And I know that episode's happening when we watch it tonight. So I've already like, how am I going to talk to my 10 year old about sex? And, you know, as we've been watching it, one of the conversations I had with her was, you know, because there's this... Uh, scene where she kind of gets pressured a little bit uh, around sex and I remember telling her like you should probably know that I didn't use I don't know what words I'm allowed to say I'm sorry I usually am pretty blunt but but like boys are really horny I didn't use that word I forget how I described it but I just wanted to prepare her for pressures she might feel um, because the burden and the onus does tend to be on women to say no. And men don't always understand that they really need to get affirmative consent, um, not just rely on, because when fear is instilled, which is naturally instilled when there's a boy and a girl and there's a dynamic where he could hurt her, you know, a girl may not say no because she doesn't feel safe to say no and feels that pressure. So it's trying to like describe that. And then on the other hand, I have an eight-year-old coming up behind her who's a little boy and talking to him about things like consent and, you know, being affirmative with that. So it's not, so you can't be, he can't be confused when he wakes up in the morning. He has, he's mindful enough to think, okay, check in with a girl. And these are just conversations our parents didn't have with us. And, 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 and this, so that's for sex, but also healthy and unhealthy relationships. I find that unless a boy punches a girl, we don't understand it's abusive, you know, but they're so, and, and same in the role reverse, right? I was doing a training with some resident advisors at um, Angelo State University, and we were talking about power and control. And I was trying to talk to them and I asked, you know, boys, have you ever had a girlfriend who has tried to get you to do something by threat, like by, I forget how I described it, but basically I remember this boy saying, you know, I had a girlfriend who I was kept trying to break up with her and she told me she was pregnant. And I said, well, was she pregnant? And he said, no. And I said, but how did that make you feel? What Did you feel like you had a choice to break up with her at that point? He's like, no, I felt like I couldn't break up with her. And I said, that's power and control. So it's, you know, it's not always these identifiable slaps in the face, especially in that earlier age group. It's about knowing what the signs are. You know, if you leave me, I'm going to kill myself. It's these tactics that, you know, you and I identify like that, but your average parent they don't know anything beyond like, oh, he really has a crush on her. Isn't that cute? He keeps trying to. And I think we are scared as parents of, uh, of especially girls to say this could be something that is, you know, abusive. Well, again, it's, it's looking beyond black eyes and 
Broken Bones, which is um, a big, uh, one of the goals of Voices for Change is to help people understand intimate partner violence beyond black eyes and broken bones. And I'm so grateful for your insights and the um, information that you shared with us. You've got to come back again because you we have so much more to talk about. Um, but I really appreciate you being here. I want to uh, let our viewers know that um, Voices for Change is about to start a webinar series um, where we're going to be doing a virtual tour around the United States um, and talking about specific topics related to intimate partner violence. Our first one is going to be held on February the 4th, and we're going to be um, in Pennsylvania, which is where I am. So we're kind of starting at home. And um, we're gonna be talking about teen dating violence. Each one of these webinars is gonna have an expert, a local expert is going to have a victim of violence, a survivor of violence, and a member of our target audience um, to try to get a deeper understanding of um, the problem and the solutions. So um, Kelsey is gonna come back and she's gonna be talking to us about this webinar that we're gonna be doing in March. Um, and Kelsey, where, where, do you remember what we called it? Um, we called it Beyond Defunding and yeah. um, Finding- Community partners in, in, in policing. And so, you know, people get really caught up in this defunding means we don't like cops. I, 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 most of my best friends are police officers, by the way. Um, and I, I, what I hope what we're going to be able to really get into are what are some burdens we can remove from police officers? We ask them to wear about 59,000 different hats, and then they get very criticized when they don't respond the right way. And so what we're going to talk about, what are some community-based solutions that we have in Texas, some in Houston, uh, Project Beloved, we're going to mention them and some of the great things they've done by creating soft interview rooms. And then uh, the Center for Forensic Excellence, we're going to talk about what are some solutions that our community partners outside the law enforcement community can do to kind of take some of those hats off of police officers so that people understand if the whole defending police movement in a different way from the angle of we really want to relieve the burden from some police officers, not leave them high and dry. I'm really looking forward to doing that webinar with you. And um, I, I think that uh, there's a lot of conversation that can be had around that subject for sure. Um, I, uh, I really, again, I wanna thank you for being here. Hope, um, I'm so uh, grateful for the opportunity to have the Voices for Change radio um, at Incandescent Radio. Yeah, it's my pleasure to have you all. This has been an amazing, fascinating, and really, you know, it's so horrifying when you think about the concept of strangulation and how women, you know, how could she had obvious bruises and how could that she not have won that case? So there's so much work to be done around women coming to the forefront and men really standing up. Uh, yesterday, we did a wonderful interview with Laverne Gordon at the Love Life Now Foundation. And in February, she has the, the white pledge where men stand up and say, I will not hit a woman with this hand. And if I see anyone doing it, I will stop it, right? So we need way more of that. And the two, you two amazing women, just I'm honored to help you spread the word uh, so we can end domestic violence and make the world a better place for sure. And Kelsey, I just got to tell you, when my daughter was 10, I took her to see Love Actually because it looked like a really cute love story. So just saying. <laughs> we all do these things. <laughs> now how the losing the virginity scene goes. Oh I know that conversation. Like recovering her eyes, like, oh my God. <laughs> I know, I know. But you know, these are difficult conversations that we have to have as mothers and as women, both with our sons and our daughters and their husbands should be equipped to have as well. One last thing, just so it doesn't get lost in this, in case there's someone listening, I want to recognize that while so much of the movement around strangulation begun with domestic violence, this is something that criminals um, use in sex crimes, in child abuse, in homicides, 
it is not just limited to domestic violence. So I just wanted to take a moment in case there is someone who has been sexually assaulted and experienced that or felt pressure during a sexual act is that this is something that all types of abusers are, are, are using. It's just something that we unveiled at first in domestic violence. Um, and I'm doing a series in May that's called the sexualization of strangulation, fetish or felony. And so feel free to reach out to me, um, Kelsey, at respondagainstviolence.org, or if you'd like to request the strangulation supplement, you can go to respondagainstviolence.org. We're just kind of kicking off, um, so don't judge the website and that stuff, but we are really working to become a productive think tank for practitioners to have tools um, at their fingertips to help them in any type of violent crime and trauma. We're definitely going to have to have Kelsey back to talk about Respond. Um, we, we are in conversations about how we're gonna partner um, our efforts from Voices for Change with Respond because there are so many um, synergies. Uh, I know people don't like that word, sorry. Um, but we are really uh, thrilled to have you here. Thank you so much, Kelsey, um, for joining us today and for doing the very, very important work that you do. Yes. And hang in there. Yeah, hang in there, uh, both of you, right? And we're here to help raise your voice at Voices for Change and Incandescent Radio Network. We're honored to do this weekly show with Tracy Schott, fantastic filmmaker, creator of Finding Jen's Voice, an award-winning documentary, and Kelsey McKay. You can find more information about both of these amazing women on Incandescent Women Magazine. Tracy was our October cover story, so you could go to the back issues and find her there. Kelsey's also featured there, and of course, on voicesforchangeradio.com on the Incandescent Radio Network. So I'm Hope Gibbs, honored and beyond belief to be sharing these stories with all of you. I know that you'll be touched and you hopefully will be inspired to take action. So let's put an end to domestic violence and we'll all do everything we can to make that happen. Yes. All right. Thank you yes. all on Facebook and everywhere else where we're recording today uh, for listening. And we look forward to talking to you next Tuesday where Tracy will be entering, interviewing another amazing person in the domestic violence abuse domestic violence abuse awareness world. Actually, next week, um, we're going to be interviewing Kelly Devine, who is the artistic director of Global Peace Film Festival, who has discovered how to use film to create world peace and, and diminish violence. So Kelsey uh, is actually a consultant on the Voices for Change um, effort, and I'm excited to have her. We're gonna we're gonna actually be doing that on Monday next week, um, so we're scheduled for Monday the 25th at 1 p.m. So I'll right. see you then. Yeah, well, thank you for keeping track and for sharing that. We'll share it out on social media too. So looking Great. forward to talking with you again. Have a wonderful day. Stay safe and uh, be well. Hey.